Hello, I'm Wendy Adler with Articulating, and I'm happy to be bringing you an art talk today about portraiture in painting. Portraiture is very familiar to everybody, right? It's a picture of somebody or something. It can be an animal, it doesn't have to be a person. Um, and portraiture has been around a very, very long time. Some people like to think that portraiture began with the Lascaux cave paintings of thousands of years ago. I actually think a better example of early portraiture would be the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I say that because if we look at the paintings from inside of the pyramids and the tombs, we can actually see distinguishing features in the people. We can tell a man from a woman, we can tell a slave from a king. So to me, that's a more realistic form of early portraiture. But we're gonna talk about portraits in painting. You can have a portrait that's a drawing or a sculpture, but we're gonna focus on the history of portraits using paint as a medium. Here we go. I love this quote by Kahindi Wiley. Paintings are situational. They are read in times in which they occur. What he's saying is paintings are really just a snapshot of the way that you can remember or the image that you choose to remember of a person at a particular point in time. Not to say that portraiture can't be embellished or made to be perhaps more flattering than the reality, but portraiture is generally meant to commemorate somebody. There are lots of examples of early portraiture and there's lots of examples of contemporary portraiture, paintings instead of photographs. And we're gonna look at all of those starting right now. Here we have two examples of early portraiture. On the left, we have the Jones Family Conversation piece painted by William Hogarth in 1730. And on the right, we have an assortment of portrait miniatures. Let's talk about the Jones Family Conversation piece first. A conversation piece was the literal art term for a painting where there are several people interacting. And it was a form that was popularized by Joshua Reynolds, a British painter of the day. This particular piece was commissioned by Robert Jones, who was a sheriff in Scotland at the time. He would have had good standing in the community as a sheriff. And so it made sense that he would have been wealthy or at least considered upper class here. This particular picture shows him standing on the right with his sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, and his younger brother, Oliver, is also pictured. His mother, Mary, is in the right front corner with her dog, a little spaniel, and then there's a boy in the back playing with a monkey, which is a little ironic because the rest of them look so prim and proper, and here's this kid in the back playing with a monkey. The monkey would have been another kind of symbol of wealth because you wouldn't have had access to a monkey and some people even kept them as pets, but you wouldn't have had a monkey around unless you were wealthy. So hence the reason for the monkey in the picture. On the right, we have an assortment of different portraits and those portraits could have been used in a variety of ways. They were first made in the 1500s by the French and English courts. And they were made because they were portable and they could be given as gifts or exchanges between the courts. The pictures would have been realistic or at least kind of realistic because you probably can't find anybody that looks like that if you were to go outside. And they could have been worn in a locket or they could have been kept in a breast pocket. The paintings would have been um, painted on calf skin and they would have used enamel, which would have given them those bright, beautiful colors. Next, we're gonna talk about Giuseppe Arsimbaldo. He was an Italian painter from the 1500s. So we're talking 500 years ago as an example of kind of some funky portraiture, right? This particular one is called Water, and it was done in 1566. Now, Arsimbaldo was Italian, but he had been hired by both Viennese courts and Czechoslovakian courts, and so he had quite a reputation, and he was able to make a living as an artist. He liked to employ elements from a person's industry or trade. So in this case, we can probably guess that while the likeness isn't very realistic, Whoever it was that he was trying to commemorate here would have been involved with the sea, either as a trader or perhaps as a um, member of the court that owned a fleet of ships. I love that we have the little Neptune crown on the top there. We have so many different examples of the fish, right? And from a distance, you may not even realize what it was you were looking at here. 
But clearly Arsimbaldo had a great sense of humor and I think a very modern take on making portraits. In some ways this looks surrealistic and yet surrealism didn't even come into our art world until the 1930s and 40s. So Arsimbaldo I think was really ahead of his time and very innovative. This particular picture would have been an oil painted on panel on wood board. And in real life, it's about two and a half foot by three foot. So a pretty big size. Next, we're gonna talk about a really famous portraitist, Rembrandt Van Rijn. Most of us just refer to him as Rembrandt. The Van Rijn part would refer to his hometown or his village. And he lived from 1606 to 1669. Even today, Rembrandt is considered one of the foremost and most studied portraitists ever in the art world. He was one of the best, and he did about 80 different self-portraits, probably because he was his own best model. He was available whenever he wanted to paint, and he captured himself in a variety of his stages of life. We have several pictures in this uh, compilation here of him as a young man, we have him in middle age, we have him as an old man, we have him in realistic wardrobe, we have him in costumes. Rembrandt was a big collector of costumes and often would pose his subjects in various costumes of the day. So the pictures, at least the facial expression and features were pretty realistic and a good study Notice that there's very, very little in the way of background on these pictures. And so these portraits really were all about the subject, in this case, himself. He was, in some of these, very well-dressed and looking very noble. This would have been uh, part of his life where he was obviously um, well-regarded and uh, able to get commissions. And then there are some other pictures of him looking a little more contemplative, a little more serious, definitely older in life, realizing uh, his mortality was coming. He says that a lot of these pictures asserted his rightful place as a sought-after artist. In other words, the guy had a little bit of an ego. So we see both the high points and the low points reflected in his facial expressions here. This is a picture you're probably familiar with, although you don't know a lot about the artist. This is called Napoleon Crossing the Alps, and it was painted in 1801-ish by Jacques-Louis David, a Frenchman. This is a beautiful romanticized scene, and I'll explain the little propaganda tag there in a moment. David painted five versions of this with some minor variations in each. Sometimes we see Napoleon with a yellow cape. Sometimes we see him on a darker horse. Sometimes the background elements are a little different. But we're gonna go ahead and talk about this particular one. The equestrian scene was the artist's idea. Originally, this picture was commissioned by the King of Spain to commemorate Napoleon's successful battle, but he wasn't on a horse. In reality, Napoleon would have been led by a guide sitting on a donkey. So there is a little bit of fantasy and romanticism that's been added to this portrait. Here he's on his white horse, which of course stands for nobility and heroics. And Napoleon, we all know, even if you don't know much about Napoleon, everybody knows that Napoleon was a little guy. And yet in this picture, Napoleon doesn't look like a little guy. He looks quite heroic. And he's definitely in proportion with this gigantic, white, noble, strong horse, right? So again, a little artistic license was taken there. Napoleon refused to sit for this picture, and so the artist actually had to use his son as a model in the painting. And so he sat his son up on top of a ladder so he could get the proper proportions here. The horse, however, was allowed to pose for the picture, and so David had an accurate uh, model for the, for the horse in this picture. This is a very large picture in real life. It's about 126 inches by 104 inches. So like 10 foot by 12 foot, if you were to see it. Right now it hangs in Versailles, although originally it hung in the Louvre. Now, at some point we all know that Napoleon fell out of favor. And so by 1815, this picture had been removed from the Louvre and put in storage. And so now it does hang in Versailles because of the fact that Napoleon had fallen out of favor in the 1800s. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at Napoleon leading his troops into Austria in May of 1800 to defeat them 
How do we know this? Well, we have Napoleon, of course, looking pretty successful. We have troops in the background here. Uh, we can see that there's a cannon or something on a, on a wheeled cart uh, being pushed by soldiers. We can see the French flag, very small and faint in the lower right-hand corner. And then we have the storm clouds in the background, which lend drama to this picture. And we have this little peak of blue sky coming through, which is kind of a clue that everything's going to work out OK, right? Um, so David, of course, wanted to paint this equestrian scene with Napoleon. Um, we have the names of other great leaders painted in the rocks in the bottom left. We have Charlemagne and we have Hannibal. And then Napoleon's name himself is painted in this picture. He's in this wind whipped frenzy. The horse's mane is flying and his tail is flying and the cape is flying. And Napoleon looks very mighty and noble as he's leading his troops forward. He's got his tri cornered hat. He's framed nicely by that red wind whipped cloak. And the soldiers are in the back and off we go. Everything is great in this picture, right? Until he falls out of favor. So as I said before, this is a very well-known work. And if you were to YouTube this or to Google this and look for the other editions, it's kind of a Where's Waldo exercise. You can find all the differences between the five pictures if you're looking for something kind of fun to do. So what is this picture? You're all muttering to yourself, this is Whistler's mother. And you'd be right, but it's not called Whistler's mother. Although James Whistler would be thrilled that that's what we refer to it as because James Whistler had a pretty big ego. And so just the fact that we were saying it was Whistler's mother, which of course acknowledges who painted it, would be very pleasing to him. James Whistler was an American. However, most of his practice was done in England. He was a smart guy and he figured out that during the time of the late 1800s, Americans were much more focused on what was happening in their own country with civil war and the, the, all the conflict. And so people weren't really buying art there. He figured out he could go not only train in Europe, but he could settle in Europe and he could definitely make a better living there. So that's exactly what he did. He moved to Europe and never came back to practice in America. He was a big believer in art for art's sake, meaning that he didn't really want you to know what the subject of the matter was. He really wanted you to focus on the art elements within the picture. So the real name of this picture is Arrangement in Gray and Black Number 1. And what he wanted you to see was the contrast and the objects themselves. He didn't want you to focus on the narrative. So he probably wouldn't like that we call it Whistler's Mother for that particular reason. He'd rather that we see how brilliant a painter he was with his use of contrast and structure and composition. So what are we looking at here? We are indeed looking at Whistler's mother. This is his mother, Anna. Um, Anna lived in Atlanta, but she lost two sons during the Civil War conflict, sons that had stayed behind in America instead of going overseas like James. So at some point, Anna, after the war, decided that she would be safer if she went to Europe to be with James. She had sympathies for both the North and the South, and so she didn't really want to stick around after the Civil War because she was concerned about what might happen next. So off she goes to Europe, and James paints this beautiful picture of her in 1871. This is really a study in contrast, not just the colors, but look at Anna herself. Let's talk about her first. We have her in this very sober black dress. As I said, she had lost a couple sons, but then she's got this beautiful, delicate lace. She's got lace around her face on her cap, and she has lace on her cuffs, and she's holding a delicate lace hanky. So we have black and white, and we have strong and frail. And I think this really is a statement about Anna's personality in some ways. Her face looks uh, a little bit serious, a little sincere, um, but she also looks very gentle. So again, we have a little bit of a contrast going there. And then the thing I think that's most interesting about Anna is look at her feet. Her feet are elevated on a platform, right? Why? Why are her feet up on a platform? Well, remember, this was his mother, and we all think of our parents 
perhaps as a little bit elevated. This was an homage to his mother and so off the ground, maybe a little bit angelic and spiritual, right? Whistler was definitely one that thought about the spiritual side of things. And so there is a lot of contrast going on here. That black of the dress anchors her to the bottom of the picture and yet her feet are elevated off the ground. Now, as I said, Whistler had an ego, and so that etching that hangs on the wall in the background, it's one of his, just to make sure we knew that he could do other things besides portraits. Now, he painted this right around the time of Impressionism in Europe, and yet we wouldn't really call him an Impressionist. He's definitely a portraitist, but he's not painting in an Impressionist manner. We can see the brush strokes. And we can see maybe in the curtain just a little bit of an element of Impressionism. But we wouldn't have really pegged this as a work that was done during Impressionism. He kind of thumbed his nose at the whole idea, I think. As for the title, Arrangement in Gray and Black, as I said, he really wants us to focus on the painterly techniques he sees here and not the fact that this is a portrait of his mother. Vincent van Gogh, actually van Gogh, but if I keep saying van Gogh, I'm going to have a sore throat. So we're going to call him van Gogh with the little acknowledgement that I know that's not the proper pronunciation. Vincent van Gogh, 1853 to 1890, a fan favorite for sure. But what a lot of people don't know about him is he really didn't become an artist until the 1880s and he only painted for nine years. So all of those beautiful Van Gogh paintings that we love so much came about very late in his very short and tragic life. So a little background on Vincent Van Gogh. He is Dutch, of course, and I could do a whole slide presentation on him, which I'd love to do at a future date. But for now, understand that he was mostly self-trained. He was very close with his brother, Theo, and that's where we'll begin this story. Van Gogh had gone to Paris to live with his brother Theo, who was an art dealer. And uh, Vincent was a starving artist. He had failed at every possible career that he had tried before. But he saw that Theo was having success in the art world. And it was something that was really interesting to Vincent. And so off he goes to Paris to live with Theo and to absorb the master works of the Louvre and to start to become an artist. The other thing that's happening during this time is trade routes to Asia have started to open up. And so a lot of Japanese and Chinese cargo are working their way into Asia. And artists are really interested in this because a lot of the cargo that comes is wrapped in Japanese woodblock prints. This was a completely new genre. Artists had never seen the perspective and the flat use of color that the Japanese used in those woodblock prints. And so artists were fascinated with this. And the Japanese woodblock prints were cheap, they were easy to get, and so they became um, an affordable indulgence for Vincent. In fact, Vincent actually, despite the fact that he was broke and not working, managed to amass a collection of about 600 Japanese woodblock prints that he referred to for the rest of his career. So here's Vincent collecting, collecting these Japanese woodblock prints, living with Theo in Paris. Theo falls in love and threes a crowd. So Vincent decides it's time to go to the south of France. And so off he goes and his idea is to start an artist commune. Peace, love, and art. All these artists are going to come and we're all going to paint together and we're going to pick flowers and everything's going to be great. Except the only artist that Vincent can talk into coming with him is Paul Gauguin. So Gauguin and Vincent go to the south of France where the light is so beautiful and the Impressionists have begun to work and they start to paint together and they paint together for a couple years and then uh, the infamous Vincent cuts off his ear episode occurs. Uh, Gauguin has been down there for a couple months. Gauguin decides that Vincent's a little too crazy for him and that it's time for him to leave. Vincent is very, very upset about this and he cuts off a piece of his ear. Gauguin leaves, Vincent gifts the ear to one of his friends in town, and that's the beginning of the end for Vincent. Vincent is then committed to an asylum, and the rest is history, literally. But anyway, I tell you all of this because if you look at the assortment of portraits here, you can see the one down on the bottom row where Vincent's ear is bandaged. 
Vincent paints his self-portraits uh, very realistically, I'm afraid. And so we do have a lot of different facial expressions, a lot of different haircuts and hats. And we have the situation here where Vincent acknowledges that he has indeed cut off a piece of his ear. He's in the asylum. And in the background of that picture, you might notice what looks like a Japanese woodblock print. Okay, so I digress a little bit from the whole portraiture thing there, but only because it was really interesting. So we can see here that Vincent, the poor starving artist, uses himself as a model, not because of the reasons that Rembrandt did, which was really to practice facial expressions. Vincent was a little broader minded. He was broke, he couldn't afford to hire models. And so he used himself as his best way to practice. He did get commissions for portraits as income. And so it was really important for him to be practicing. And really the only artwork that Vincent was ever able to sell were these commissioned portraits. All of the beautiful landscapes and pieces that we know of Van Gogh, those were never sold during his lifetime and barely even acknowledged. How sad is that? But I did want you to recognize that Van Gogh is also considered to be one of our foremost portraitists. He painted somewhere between 36 and 43 portraits. You'd think there'd be a better, harder number, right? But as you'll see, if you ever try to do art research, numbers are just a suggestion. But he painted most of his self-portraits between 1886 and 1889. Here we have a portraitist you may not be quite as familiar with, Amadeo Modigliani, Italian, lived from 1884 to 1920, again, an artist that lived a pretty short life, and he actually died tragically at age 36 from tuberculosis. Even more tragically, his um, eight-month pregnant lover, who was pregnant with their first child, jumped out a window five days later because she was so struck with grief. So now I've got you on a downer, right? But let's talk about Modigliani generally. He was considered a wunderkind. He was an Italian Jewish painter and sculptor, excellent draftsman. He could sketch and draw. And in art circles, they loved him. He was different. His style was very modern and progressive. What was his style? Well, here's his style. We're looking at it now. We have elongated features. We kind of have that drawn face and those blank eyes, right? There's no expression on the eyes. We do have a picture. This is actually one of his more pleasant pictures because it shows him himself. Uh, this was the year before he dies. You can see he's got his brush and his palette here. Uh, so he has painted himself, but it's a very modern painting. We see brush strokes, kind of like we would see in a Van Gogh work. And we see simplified features. We see kind of a, a limited color palette here. We have the arched neck, and those were all kind of characteristics that he employed in his work. Here we have two other examples of his work. Again, the same kind of features. We have those blank eyes. We have the elongated facial feature. Now the nude on the left was very, very controversial and provocative for the day. In fact, he got into a lot of trouble for painting nudes. Why? Nudes had been done for hundreds of years, but nudes with realistic features had not been done. Now, I was a little conservative in picking this particular nude because we're looking at her from the back. But you can imagine the horror and the gasps from people that saw the nudes that were painted from the front and actually showed nipples and showed genitalia with great detail. So Modigliani was considered kind of a bad boy in the art world, and it was tragic that we lost him when we did. So now we're going into more modern contemporary artists, artists that are actually living today and working today. And here we have one you may not be familiar with. This is George Boslitz, and he's German. He was born in 1938. He is still teaching in Germany today, and he has an unusual approach to art. Now you might be looking at this picture and thinking to yourself, Wendy, this is backwards, but it's really not. This is a picture that he painted. And I think the quote that I have posted here tells us a lot about his thought. He says, a method of objectifying a work of art without entering the realm of abstraction or allowing the motif to dominate. 
And that's a great explanation for why is this guy upside down? He's chosen the subject of this portrait and he's painting it upside down because he wants you to look at the technical aspects of the work. He doesn't necessarily want you to recognize what the figure is. And no, he did not paint this right side up and then turn it upside down, which I'll prove to you in the next slide. What he actually is doing is he's forcing himself to look at the subject of the portrait in a different way and almost objectify it, make it so that he's focusing more on the structure itself. Now, of course, there is a little bit of a sense of humor here. You can't possibly drink anything upside down. So why would he paint something being drunk upside down? But that's beside the point. Here's another example of his work. This is actually a finger painting that he did called Adler, which is German for eagle, which I felt like I kind of was obligated to uh, include in this presentation since my last name is Adler. So this one is done finger painting style. And how can I prove to you that it was done upside down? Look at the bottom of the work. Look at the direction of the drips. The drips obviously would drip from the top down. And so just by showing the drips in the work, he's proving to us that he's actually objectified his subject here, the eagle, and painted it upside down, forced himself to think of it as an object instead of seeing it in its proper orientation. Just an interesting approach, right? Now we move on to Chuck Close, an American artist who I just love. Talk about a guy that's got a great outlook on life. This was one of his most famous early pictures, and it is indeed a painting. This is called photorealism. So he took a photograph of himself in this position and then painted based on the photograph. Now you wouldn't know that unless you got up really close to it, right? And examined the paint itself. Um, and I love that we have him standing next to this painting. Um, so we have a photograph of him next to a photorealistic painting of himself. Just kind of a little mind game there. Um, Chuck Close, born in 1940. This particular one is called Big Self Portrait, done in 1968. And he currently lives in the state of Washington. His name is really Charles, but some journalist at some point in time referred to him as Chuck in a write-up, and so now he goes by the name Chuck Close. He had difficulty in school. Uh, he really wasn't all that interested in the subjects, and so he was much more effective um, when he was drawing or participating in art. In 1988, he had a severe spinal artery collapse, which basically committed him to a wheelchair for the rest of his life and limited his small motions, his small movements. So he does paint from a wheelchair these days. He uses a very long brush so he's able to reach his canvases and he paints in large scale so he uses very large canvases well if you're in a wheelchair how are you able to work your way around a large canvas he's figured all of this out he's in a chair that elevates and then comes back down and then he uses the long brush of course so he can control his motion a little better and he's mounted the canvas to the wall on kind of a lazy Susan type of apparatus. So he's able to turn the canvas instead of have to manipulate his body around when he's painting. Now that sounds very complicated, but on our next slide, you're gonna see how it is that he's able to accomplish this. Here we have his modern or current style. This is another self-portrait done in 2004, 2005. And this portrait would be far more effective if you were seeing it from a distance. It is large. And if you were standing in a gallery or you entered into a gallery from across the room, it wouldn't look quite as PC as it does up close like this. But let's talk a little bit about how it is that he does this. Here's a quote. I'm overwhelmed by the whole. How do you make a big head? How do you make a nose? I'm not sure, but by breaking the image down into small units, I make each decision into a bite-sized decision. I don't have to reinvent the wheel every day. It's an ongoing process. The system liberates and allows for intuition, and eventually I have a painting. 
So what's he saying here? He's saying here that he actually takes a photograph, takes the photograph and divides it into a grid. So he actually superimposes a grid onto that photo. And then he takes each small square as its own painting. And I have an example of that down here in the lower part of the picture. You can see that each cell of the picture or each grid square of the picture is its own little abstract drawing. And then when he puts it all together, uh, the eye helps do the blending, kind of like a pointillist technique like we have seen with George Seurat in the past. So Chuck Close does this because he's rebelled against the abstract expressionism, which was the type of art that was being practiced when he was coming up in the art world. And instead he's turned to portraiture as his genre, but he's incorporated the ab X or the abstract figures as we see in that lower picture into the portraiture. So a very unique, very unusual, very individualized technique that I really haven't seen anybody else do nearly as well as he does. He does this with other photographs of celebrities, not just himself. Um, and if you walk into a gallery with his work on several walls, it's really an overwhelming experience. It's always fun to get up close to those pictures and see because each cell is different. Sometimes it's abstract, sometimes it's more fingerprint, sometimes it's just different gradients of color. So really an interesting guy that is still working today. Lastly, we're going to talk about Kehinde Wiley, an African-American artist working today, born in 1977 in Los Angeles. Wiley took an interest in art very early in his life. His parents supported him and would actually send him across town on a bus from Los Angeles all the way to Pasadena to study at the Pasadena Art School. As he got older, he went off to Yale Art School and began practicing on the East Coast. Wiley's thing is that he takes classical portrait positioning and uses current day dress and motifs and models and clothes to use portraiture in a completely fresh way. He personifies blacks because he never saw them in portraits when he was growing up. Most of the portraits we've talked about today have been white people, right? So he wanted to bring a new focus to African Americans. Look at how beautifully in this Obama portrait, he portrays their skin. There's like a luminescence. You can see the wrinkles. It's very flattering and, and glowing, very realistic in the skin portrayal that he does here. And his quote is that he wants to position them in states of grace and self-possession. So he is a true portraitist trying to make flattering portraits and he's chosen African-Americans as his subject. Let's talk for a moment about the background here on this Obama portrait. So we have this beautiful patterned flora and fauna, lots going on back there. And yet it really doesn't take away from the main subject matter of this picture, which of course is Barack Obama. That background was inspired by William Morris, who was a Great Britain interior de decorator during the 1800s. He was the first to use um, elaborately patterned flowers and animals, berries, fruits, that kind of stuff for patterns for wallpapers and fabrics. And Wiley has used that same technique for his backgrounds. Very lush, very colorful, almost gives it a bit of a pop art twist, right? Now, the other thing that he's done that's very clever is he's worked into the background here a few different kinds of flowers. We have chrysanthemums, those pink flowers, and those are the state flower of Chicago, making nods to the fact that Obama's political career began there. We have the jasmine pictured in the background, and that's a nod to Hawaii, where of course Obama grew up. And then those yellow flowers that we see are a native flower of Kenya, making a nod to Obama's heritage. Of course, his father was from Kenya. So we have Obama sitting in this chair. Um, one of Wiley's techniques is to take the African-American off the street, put him in his street clothes, and then put him in a classical position. And we're gonna 
have a better example of that on our last slide. But we can even see that here in the picture with Obama. He's dressed in a, in a modern day suit, not a tie. So he's kind of got that casual, approachable look that he liked to foster. We have very strong hands there pictured, which gives us the uh, element of power. And of course, as president of the United States, he would have had a lot of power. He's sitting on a very traditional old American style chair, not a throne, but something that alludes to the sense of patriotism and America. And he's looking at us in a very approachable, um, confident leadership type way, right? He's got that role all about him. And so I think Wiley really has captured the essence of Obama in this picture. Now here we have a comparison of a Wiley picture on the right and the same picture that we talked about earlier, the Jacques-Louis David picture of Napoleon on the left. And you can see that Wiley has taken an African-American in current day clothes, look at the work boots, I love the work boots, and the bandana tied around the guy's head. And he's put him in a classical or more classic portraiture setting, right? He's on exactly the same kind of horse that Napoleon is on here. The front with the rocks and the names carved in them, exactly what we see in the Napoleon portrait. The background, of course, is more like those William Morris patterns like we saw in the Obama picture. So Wiley's taken his own spin and used portraiture in classical format, but with modern day elements worked in. And of course, that's what makes an artist great. He's able to use classical art techniques, but put his own spin on it so that his style is recognized and that it feels current and that it feels like something different. And I think that Wiley does an excellent job of kind of a good summation of what we talked about here with portraiture. I thank you very much for joining me on our talk about portraiture today. If this was something you enjoyed or if you have some criticism or constructive feedback for me, I would love to hear from you. My address, my email here is posted on the screen, wendyarticulatingart at gmail.com. If this was something that you enjoyed and you'd like to see more, I encourage you to go on YouTube and do a search for Wendy Adler Articulating. There's about a dozen more videos on a very broad variety of art subjects that I've posted over the last year. And I would love for you to watch them and give me your feedback on those as well. I hope that I have the privilege of bringing you another art talk at some point soon. And I hope that you're able to stay safe and entertained during this time. Thank you so much.